All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming out to the Barnes & Noble at Boston University in support of our ongoing author series. We're very honored to have uh, Dr. Wynn with us this evening. I'd like to quickly thank the alumni board, which this gentleman who's standing here with me is from. Um, they've been a great help in promoting this event with us. So now I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Aaron McDaniel from the <coughs> alumni board to properly introduce Dr. Wynn. Please welcome Mr. McDaniel. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron McDaniel, and I'm a member of the CAS Alumni Board, which, if you don't know about it, is a uh, board that helps connect the university and all its alumni across all the uh, institutions to um, participate in a variety of social, networking, and educational events. Uh, it's a really great board um, and pr uh, permeates all across uh, the CAS campus, so uh, excuse me. Um, to give you a brief summary of Professor Wynn's background, I would have to stand here for about 20 minutes because he has so many awards and accomplishments and professorships that I couldn't even do him uh, justice in my brief uh, introduction here. But what I can do is just uh, tell you a little bit about where he came from, if it, perhaps you don't already know. He graduated with a PhD, PhD from Yale University, um, where he went on to be an associate uh, professor in the English department, while simultaneously moonlighting uh, for an advertising agency, uh, writing interesting jingles and uh, a lot of other uh, copy for them. Um, after that, he spent 13 years at the University of, excuse me, 15 years at the University of Michigan um, before he came to BU in 1998 as the chair of the English department. Um, so I'm very honored uh, to present uh, Professor James Wynn, and thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. I've been looking forward to the publication of this book for a very long time. When I published the Dryden biography in 1987, the New York Times was kind enough to interview me, and of course they asked about my next project. Well, I spun them a yarn about writing a book about poetry and war, and I really meant to do it, but a couple of other projects intervened, and I finally started to work seriously on this book during a sabbatical taken in the year 2001 and 2002, and I'd actually written a version of the introduction and uh, part of the, uh, of the first chapter when our nation suffered an unprecedented attack on its civilian population with the result that my book suddenly became a lot more timely. It's the only book I've ever had to revise to keep up with the headlines. And once I finished it, it proved to be, oddly, a difficult book to place. Marketing people at various presses kept telling my agent that guys who read books about war think poetry is for women. So I'm very grateful to Linda Bree at Cambridge, who immediately understood that my aim was to get those guys to pay some attention to poetry and to get the small but dedicated audience that reads poetry to consider how deeply the history of their beloved art form is intertwined with the history of war. Early in the project, I took a decision that was hard for me, but right for the book. I decided not to write a chronological history, starting with Homer and marching forward. Instead, I've gathered my poems into chapters shaped by themes with broad historical reach, honor, shame, empire, chivalry, comradeship, and liberty. That means that readers will sometimes have to join me in leaping from Virgil to Vietnam, from Homer to World War I, of course, I've tried to give due respect to the specific cultural and historical context of the poems, but I think thematic juxtapositions of poems from very different eras can also teach us something. This evening, I propose to talk briefly about three poems from three quite different wars, and this time I will move in chronological order. My first example is the best-known Cavalier poem on honor, To Lucasta, Going to the Wars, by Richard Lovelace, first published in 1649. This is the way it first appeared. If asked for one poetic phrase about honor, many readers of English poetry might recall the concluding lines, I could not love thee dear so much, loved I not honor more. These words have entered our cultural memory as a timeless and touching example of the soldier's farewell to his lady. But the poem they conclude is an exercise in denial. The Thirty Years' War and the English Civil Wars brought violence on an unprecedented scale to Europe, but the Cavalier poets clung to the conventions of epic and chivalric literature and avoided depicting the mechanized slaughter of the present in which they lived. If their poems were our only evidence, we might imagine that 17th century wars still featured single combat by heroic nobles. 
Yet the chivalric formulas of these poets, already outdated in their own period, have had a long afterlife, influencing the way later writers, including the World War I poets, have described and imagined themselves. The persistence of Cavalier poems in our cultural memory is a prime example of the way poetry has helped turn an abstraction called honor into a reason to die. Although I've known this poem by heart for over 40 years, and now believe that its commonplace sentiments conceal some troubling contradictions, it begins abruptly. Tell me not, sweet, I am unkind, that from the nunnery of thy chaste breast and quiet mind to war and arms I fly. Lovelace is silencing Lucasta. She will not be allowed to tell him that he is unkind. Not only is telling your mistress to shut up an odd way to begin a love poem, but the complaint he is trying to forestall is entirely natural. If she loves him, it makes sense for her to call him unkind, which means unnatural in this period, for abandoning her and putting himself in danger. Although the Cavalier poets were famous for their smooth lyricism, the rhythm here is quite awkward. The parenthetical address to Lucasta, sweet, breaks up the flow of the first line, not just because of the punctuation, but because that cluster of consonants, not sweet, is difficult to pronounce quickly. If you read the stanza out loud, similar clusters, that, from, chaste, breast, quiet, mind, will slow down your reading until the smoother last line of the stanza. Lovely sounds hesitant, tongue-tied, until the thought of war and arms frees up his speech. Like the rhythm, the metaphors are strange. Although Lovelace invokes Lucasta's breast, a female feature often celebrated in Cavalier verse, he calls it a chaste breast, as if trying to suppress the erotic dimension. Although he mentions her mind, a feature rarely praised in poems addressed to women at this time, he calls it a quiet mind, perhaps in his hope that her natural calmness will keep her from complaining about his desertion. But before he names either her breast or her mind, he likens them both to a nunnery, a metaphysical gesture linking flesh and spirit with religious faith and also a striking anachronism. Henry VIII had seized all the monasteries and convents in England in the 1530s, a hundred years before this poem. Those religious houses, like the Catholic faith they served, were a thing of the past. Perhaps Lovelace is invoking the medieval idea of the nunnery as part of the process by which he casts himself as a medieval knight and refuses to face the realities of the present. But he doesn't merely place Lucasta within a convent, he turns her into one. Her flesh becomes stone, and the strongest image is the idea of enclosure, with Lucasta imagined as the nunnery from which Lovelace needs to fly, a scene replayed again and again in poems about war, the hero's tender parting from his sweetheart or wife, turns into a scene of escape, with the cavalier eagerly withdrawing from the confining embrace of a woman pictured as a walled convent. He is leaving her for someone else. True. A new mistress now I chase, the first foe in the field, and with a stronger faith embrace a sword, a horse, a shield. Medieval and Renaissance poets often describe their mistresses as enemies with the power to slay them. But these lines reverse the convention. Instead of describing a woman's erotic power in military language, Lovelace uses the language of desire to describe encountering an, encountering an armed male opponent. He shows no embarrassment about the metaphors that depict him pursuing another man. Instead of embracing Lucasta, the poet now proposes to embrace a sword, a horse, and a shield. Except for the horse, these were not modern weapons. Shields were useless against artillery, and many cavalrymen in the English Civil Wars carried pistols, but firearms were too modern for Lovelace to include in this deliberately backward-looking poem. Mentioning only those weapons that might allow him to imagine himself as a knight confronting a single foe, he ignores the realities of 17th century warfare with its mass troop movements and deadly cannon. When Lovelace embraces his knightly trappings with a stronger faith, that language connects the religious imagery of the first stanza to the admission of sexual faithlessness in the second. His love of honor, oddly expressed by the grotesque image of the warrior embracing his horse and weapons, is clearly stronger than his love for his mistress or his love for God. In the final stanza, disarmingly admitting his inconstancy, Lovelace claims that Lucasta must adore it. 
Yet this inconstancy is such as you too shall adore. That word shall conveys constraint. You gotta love it would be a vulgar modern equivalent. Adore, with its religious connotations, suggests that she must not only accept, but even worship her lover's inconstancy. But the most remarkable word in these lines is the little adverb too. You too shall adore. It must mean that someone besides Lucasta adores Lovelace's inconstancy. And the only plausible con candidate is Lovelace himself. With that little word, the speaker reveals that his apology to Lucasta is really a way of convincing himself that choosing honor rather than love is the right course. The conclusion comes in those beautifully balanced lines that everyone knows. I could not love thee dear so much, loved I not honor more. There's lyrical music there, the delicate reordering of I love and not, the subtle alliteration of much and more, the murmuring R sounds in dear, honor, more. Seductive and memorable, these lines are still alive. But without intending any disrespect, for the thousands of English-speaking soldiers and sweethearts who have found comfort in Lovelace's words, I have to confess that I find their message deeply troubling. Drawing on centuries of chivalric language about honor, Lovelace says quite baldly that he embraces violence, adores his own inconstancy, and loves an abstraction called honor more than he loves Lucasta, who is told to keep silent, treated as if she had no desire, and invited to approve of her lover's unfaithfulness, yet he asks her to experience the poem as a compliment next. This illustration, in which Lucasta appears as a name on an urn that serves as the pedestal for the poet, perfectly captures his studied disregard for his lady. My next example is less well known, though it also uses erotic imagery to express the poet's feelings about war. After several more centuries of increasingly faceless violence, the self-centered obsession with personal honor that Lovelace typifies became difficult to sustain. But the poets of the Enlightenment provided an even more powerful motive for heroism by celebrating liberty and by linking the democratic and progressive values that fueled the American and French revolutions with military might. Next, Lady Liberty, usually pictured with a Phrygian cap worn by freed slaves in ancient Rome, personifies this process. Many images show her in the company of armed men in uniform. She takes on masculine and heroic qualities when she takes up arms. In the World War I poster here, the kneeling Boy Scout offers a gigantic liberty a sword far too large for his own hands, but well suited to her muscular arms and grasping fingers. The wholesale carnage of 20th century wars should have discredited such images, but the idea of fighting for freedom has proved hard to kill. Lamenting the death of a soldier poet, the American writer Hervey Allen, later the author of Anthony Adverse, made a compelling allegory out of the process by which some soldiers in World War I shifted their emotional allegiance from romance, France, and chivalry to the larger and later ideal of liberty. I think at first, like us, he did not see the goal to which the screaming eagles flew, for romance lured him, France and chivalry, but oh, before the end he knew, he knew, and gave his first full love to liberty, and met her face to face one lurid night, while the guns boomed their shuddering minstrelsy, and all the argon glowed with demon light. And liberty herself came through the wood, and with her dear boy lover kept the tryst. Clasped in her grand Greek arms, he understood whose were the fatal lips that he had kissed, lips that the soul of youth has loved from old, hot lips of liberty that kiss men cold. This is a brave and unusual poem. Allen uses an old-fashioned form, the Shakespearean sonnet, and deliberately old-fashioned words like minstrelsy and tryst to capture the alluring appeal that romance, France, and chivalry had for many young Americans. By pointing out that the dead man was like us, he avoids any hint of condescension. For the soldier poet, as for his comrades, a day in the trenches was probably long enough to dispel naive romantic and chivalric notions about war. France, first imagined as a land of wine and women, turned out to be a nightmare landscape glowing with demon light. Repeatedly insisting that his friend knew the truth before the end, Allen describes an incomplete process of maturation. The soldier poet discards the fantasies of chivalric romance in favor of a higher, more abstract devotion to liberty, 
but he never becomes an adult. Even in death, he is the dear boy lover of liberty, a huge and powerful goddess who clasps him in her grand Greek arms. The imagery bears an uncanny resemblance to the pairing of the Boy Scout and Lady Liberty in the poster. In picturing the seduction, Alan draws on Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, in which a demanding Venus pulls the boy Adonis off his horse and imprisons him in her embrace. In the final frightening lines, however, he also remembers Dr. Faustus by Shakespeare's contemporary Christopher Marlowe. At the end of Marlowe's tragedy, Faustus embraces Helen of Troy, whose image he has conjured up by magic. He asks her to make him immortal with a kiss, then recoils in horror as she sucks forth his soul. By applying these myths of fatal seduction to liberty, Alan bravely imagines liberty, whose lips the soul of youth has loved from old, as a demonic killer. If politicians had paid more attention to poems like this, they would be less glib about recycling a rhetoric about dying for liberty that had already become suspect by the time of the so-called war to end all wars. The loss of faith in traditional motives for combat, including liberty, may help explain why World War II produced much less poetry than World War I. Yet the best war poets among our contemporaries have learned to use the full range of poetic effects to express the shame and helplessness felt by participants in pointless, wasteful wars. In Waiting for the Fire, which I consider the greatest poem yet written on Vietnam, Philip Appleman begins with a list of beautiful things destroyed by the fighting. Not just the temples lifting lotuses out of the tangled trees. Not the moon on cool canals, the profound smell of the paddies, evening fires in open doorways, fish and rice, the perfect end of wisdom, but the small bones, the grace, the voices like clay bells in the wind, all wasted. In the slang of the time, wasted was a common term for killed. American soldiers wasted the enemy in firefights or got wasted by stepping on landmines. Applying that ugly word more broadly and thoughtfully, Appleman deplores the wasting of physical structures, peaceful nature, and age-old customs. He realizes that the invaders have wasted a whole culture, as well as a people whose small bones, grace, and musical voices he cherishes. As a poem of shame, Waiting for the Fire draws its strength from the poet's willingness to identify fully and deeply with the we who wasted another culture and betrayed our own. Although Appleman is a veteran of World War II, he makes no separation between himself and the younger men who fought in Vietnam. If we ever thought of the wreckage of our unnatural acts, we would never sleep again without dreaming a reign of fire. Somewhere God is bargaining for Sodom, a few good men could save the city, but in that dirty corner of the mind we call the soul, the only wash that purifies is tears. And after all, our body counts, our rape, our mutilations, nobody here is crying. People who would weep at the death of a dog stroll these unburned streets dry-eyed. Our unnatural acts, including rape and mutilation, deserve a punishment like the rain of fire God used to destroy the sinful city of Sodom. Appleman trusts his reader to remember not only the fire of God's wrath in the Old Testament, but the widespread use of napalm to rain down fire on Vietnam, evoked in the painting I've used for my cover. He remembers how Abraham bargained with God for the fate of Sodom, begging him to spare the city for the sake of a few remaining righteous men. And he slyly works in a phrase from a modern recruiting campaign, the Marines are looking for a few good men. Both parallels are bitterly ironic. By showering fire on the straw huts of innocent rice farmers, American helicopters performed a grotesque parody of God's punishment of the wicked in Sodom. When looking for a few good men, the Marines sought strong men willing to kill, not righteous men for whose sake God might spare others. After such shame, what forgiveness? Tears might serve to purify, but the conflict has so damaged Vietnamese culture that people who would weep at the death of a dog are no longer able to cry. The atrocities have numbed their senses. Realizing that American soldiers might wish to regain their innocence by simply forgetting their acts, Appleman insists that we need the wisdom of losses to prevent us from repeating our evil deeds. But forgetfulness will never walk with innocence. We save our faces at the risk of our lives, needing the wisdom of losses, the gift of despair, or we could kill again.
These simple yet trenchant lines may stand as an answer to the long sordid history of shame as a motive for combat, a topic central to the Iliad. When we kill because we're embarrassed not to, as men have done for centuries, we save our faces at the risk of our lives. Moral wisdom requires losses. Despair may be a gift. In the closing line, the moon that shines on the water, one of the peaceful elements wasted by the war, merges with the rain of fire we deserve for our unnatural acts. Cunningly shifting his pronouns, Appleman finally addresses the reader as you, reminding us that we are all complicit in the acts of our nation. Where are those volunteers to hold back the fire? Look, when the moon rises over the sea, no matter where you stand, the path of light comes to you. When Appleman wrote this poem, he imagined the path of light coming over the sea to shine its accusing beam on those responsible for the war in Vietnam. From, from today's perspective, his poem has increased its prophetic power. We have not gained wisdom from our losses, and the accusing light now falls on those responsible for the atrocities in Iraq. But as Appleman's brave use of the little word you makes clear, the light we may like to imagine falling on Lyndon Johnson or Donald Rumsfeld comes to each of us as well. In these brief examples, I've touched on honor, liberty, and shame. I've said little about chivalry and nothing about empire or comradeship, though these are equally rich and fertile topics for war poets. As I hope these examples suggest, the forms in which poets work give them an opportunity to offer a more thoughtful account of war than television or print journalists who must focus on the immediate moment and the hard facts. Yet poets as a group have no special claim to the moral high ground. Some have misused their gifts to sustain false versions of honor and chivalry or to celebrate the creation of empires. They have eaten the bread of kings and generals and falsely sung their praises. But the poets I mean to honor the ones most true to their high calling, have grasped and made real the rich, contradictory emotions that war calls forth in all of us. They are my heroes. Thank you. I was told there could be questions and answers, and I'm happy to take questions and attempt answers. Yes, sir. Um, I, was, I was thinking when you, um, uh, Terry Eagleton in his uh, recent book called Holy Terror um, has written in criticism of the United States in particular, but I think he would also apply it to uh, British policy recently. But uh, the United States is, is lacking in a sense of the tragic, and I was wondering if, if, if you could speak a little bit more to, you know, maybe the Maybe if, if there's something that has to do with our disengagement from, from poetry in general or something. That, um, uh, the wisdom of losses is, I think, what comes with the sense of the tragic. And, and especially since, say, 9-11, I, I, I think we've never had the sense that, <clears throat> that that was a moment to experience as a kind of unmitigated tragedy, but instead had kind of all the normal responses. I mean, that's what I read Eagleton is sort of saying. I don't know the, the, that recent Eagleton book, but it, there, there, there are several points in your question that I can speak to. I mean, everyone said after 9-11, you know, we've, we've never been invaded, but I'm from the South, uh, and we were certainly invaded, and the memory of the way Sherman swept across the South in the last years of the Civil War and, and took the war to the civilian population, which was a winning strategy, is, is extremely lively in the South, and certainly was in the South of my youth in the 1950s, less than a century after the end of the fighting. Uh, so there's a tragic sense there. Um, the, 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 the disengagement from poetry is, is alarming everywhere because one, one, one kind of covert project of this book is to um, lament the waning of poetry as a mode of public discourse. I mean, the poets I teach in the 18th century, people like Dryden and Pope, were writing about what was going on right then, you know, trials and, and, and wars and, and, and peace treaties. And, um, and people bought and read their poems as a way of trying to get a deeper and fuller understanding of those events. Um, the, uh, for me, the big shift, and it's not just an American shift, it's British as well, uh, and, and indeed are the European languages, I think, follow suit. Between World War I, um, a war we principally remember in literary terms for poems, 
many very great ones. And World War II, which is a war of novels, right? The Naked and the Dead, Catch-22, uh, so forth. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some powerful World War II poems, The Death of the Baltarit Gunner, Randall Jarrell. I, in my uh, chapter on comradeship, I do a long reading of a wonderful poem by F.T. Prince called Soldiers Bathing, which is a World War II poem. But they're rare. They're scattered. And what that's really about, it seems to me, is this, this waning of poetry as a mode of public discourse. Um, poets have not helped either in the sense that the dominant mode of contemporary verse as confessional verse, the, the poet contemplating his or her own feelings, um, has also been a kind of acceptance of poetry's loss of status. <coughs> Yes? How do you feel about someone like Calvin Trillin, who wrote Heck of a Job, satirizing Bush's presidency and speaking about Iraq and the mess of that? Can you speak a little bit about that? I, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't know that. that is it a poem? It, yeah, it's like a, it's in verse. I'm not sure if it's a long poem or if it's he's trying to write mm -hmm. maybe a novella. I, I have a piece coming out in the Chronicle of Higher Education next week or the week after on poems emerging from Iraq. Um, and I, I, you know, I think so far, it's very early days. Um, what's striking to me about the poems emerging from Iraq connects in a way, John, to your question, is that they, they poignantly express individual pain and, and suffering and confusion, and they don't yet um, turn it up toward those responsible. Uh, Here Bullet, which won a prize and which I think is quite powerful and good in many ways. Um, it's, it's the infantry commander and his squad, right? And that's the moral universe. Um, and the president doesn't exist in those poems. I mean, I think that time is coming. Uh, and you can trace something similar in, in earlier wars that, you know, at first it may be just the overwhelming uh, fact of being there and being in danger and being in combat and being um, in an arena of, 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 of powerful moral confusion. But eventually it has to come back um, to thinking about why. And poetry is, when it's good, is very powerful and strong at that. I say somewhere in the introduction that great poems on war can honor the dead, as we all want, must, while raising deep questions about the meaning of honor. That's, it's that doubleness in poetry that I, that I try to praise in this book. Yes, sir. Taking a look perhaps at the other side of the coin, were you able to analyze or, or come across any poetry from the uh, fighters in Iraq or the uh, yeah, terrorists yeah, the, who are, the, who are the, fighting? The points us? I'm talking about in the Chronicle piece are all, uh, well, uh, mainly by combatants, right? One, one powerful point by a wife of a combatant. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and that's actually true in, in many, many different eras. Obviously, we, you know, one reason we remember and honor so many of the World War I poets is that so many of them got killed. Very few of them survived the war. Um, and, you know, it is, I'm not, I haven't restricted myself to combatants. Homer, so far as we know, wasn't a combatant if, if he was blind, as he's reputed to be. But he's a fantastic war poet. I mean, an originary war poet. I think I read at some point that possibly the Pentagon, maybe the State Department, had some members who were going to Iraq look at the Battle of Algiers. Mm -hmm. If you could name one poem that you would like top policymakers to read or involved in formulating policy for Iraq, you know, our situation right there, what would it be and why? Oh, that's a great question. Boy, that's a terrific question. See, the trouble is you have to be reasonable. I, I, I really would love them to read the Aeneid because Virgil is at once a great celebrant of Rome and of empire, and I take our enterprise in Iraq to be essentially imperial, and at the same time the most um, perceptive poet about the cost of empire, the moral cost of empire that we've had in the Western tradition. But, I mean, these guys aren't going to read an epic poem. So, uh, you know, if I'm giving them a short lyric, I could give them this one. 
Uh, or I could give them a poem that I spend some time on in the Liberty chapter, uh, a poem by a man named William Moody, um, which is one of a harvest of great poems that, that came out in protest of the first imperialist war the U.S. fought, the war in the Philippines in the 1890s. That was a dirty, nasty little war. We killed 200,000 Filipinos, uh, lost 4,000 Americans, so that, that gives you a sense of the balance. Um, maybe it was 40,000, but I don't think so. Um, and there was a powerful anti-war movement. Mark Twain and Andrew Carnegie were among the leaders of it. And there were all these poets. And remember, these were poets who were in, had the memory. For them, the notion of war as being fought for good causes, for liberty, was very powerful because the examples for them were the American Revolution creating this country and the Civil War to free the slaves. So Moody takes off from that wonderful sculpture uh, that's up across from the Golden Dome, right, uh, of Robert Gould Shaw and the Mass Massachusetts 354th, the all-black regiment recruited in the north, half of them wiped out in a battle in South Carolina. And, and tr he takes off from that and he says basically, by fighting to deprive the Filipinos of liberty, we are shaming the, the, the sacrifice and memory of these men. And it's a tremendously strong poem. Um, and it's not as long as the Aeneid. So I guess if I were going to send, send a poem to the Oval Office, that would be the one I might send. Um. I was just thinking, you're talking about the Aeneid. I was thinking maybe about Dryden. Um, and did you find, I don't know how much time you spent on, on Dryden here, but um, you know, I, I, I think if, you know, if my kind of feeling about Dryden's late stuff is correct, that. Uh, you know, he was a kind of poet who kind of did both of these things. Right? He's profoundly Virgilian. I mean, it's his job as poet laureate to celebrate the regime, no matter how badly they screw things up. And at the same time, while he's doing it, he's showing to smart readers, to subtle readers, his his profound sense of of the, the folly uh, and and danger of some of what the kings he served were doing. I have a piece uh, actually that I published two years ago, not a line of it incorporated in this book, uh, but in a journal about Dryden's skepticism about war, uh, in which I pull all of that stuff together. Yeah. Basil. This is a question about the sources for the uh, Iraq poetry mm -hmm. article that you mentioned, and if it's a wait for the article thing, just let me know. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about your collation of sources there. I have a brother who did three tours in Iraq in the Marine Corps, and by the second tour, which was only the second year that, that we had troops deployed there, there were official measures to curtail the flow of information going home, whether that was being banned from certain types of websites, internet filters, or the, the normal reading of correspondence. Yeah, I did exactly what you would do. I started with websites, you know, um, Iraq plus poetry, and a whole bunch of stuff comes up, and you just start to filter it out. I mean, sad in a way, but but telling also is, you know, a lot of of, of what presents itself as poetry is is the poetry of pain, uh, and and written by people without. Um, a lot of training or a lot of linguistic facility and with a very shaky notion of syntax and of, and of meter. Um, but then, you know, some people with stronger voices do start to emerge. Um, and, and, you know, I, I picked two or three of them, three, I guess, in this, in this forthcoming article. It's very short. It made me cut it down to something like 1,200 words. So it's, you know, it's just a little, a little window in. But, yeah. Well, thank you all very much for coming on this rainy night. I appreciate it. Um, no, thank you.